Well, good morning to you. I thought I'd go over a few things that are on our agenda, that's on my agenda for the week, weeks ahead. Uh, let me start with uh, a bond rating trip that the county executive, myself, and my vice president and chair of the GO committee will be making on Thursday uh, to New York to meet with the rating agencies, the Standards and Poor's, the Fitches, et cetera, all three of our rating agencies, uh, to share with them why we believe our county has done all the things that a good county ought to do uh, to maintain its fiscal house in order. And we have, in my judgment, a very good story to tell because we have taken very prudent measures uh, over the course of the last several years. But that's a meeting that takes place every year in New York in which we do sit down and have those kinds of candid conversations. Um, so I feel that we have as good a conversation as we could possibly have. It's not to say that we don't face challenges in the years ahead. We do. Um, but the bottom line is that we have placed ourselves in as strong a position as possible. Secondly, what would a conversation be without talking about PEPCO? <laughs> um, so we had a, a little bit of a storm over the, over the weekend. I uh, actually was in the midst of it at the time. Um, so it was a serious event, obviously. But I do want you to know that we heard from a number of residents. Uh, in fact, I just got off the phone with a restaurant owner who over the course of the weekend lost $10,000 uh, in projected revenue uh, because his restaurant was closed. Why was his restaurant closed? Because a transformer was not working. Why was the transformer not working? Because of human error. Not because of the storm, but because Pepco did not fix it properly. So he is so upset, and so many people in the business community are so upset at time and time again losing power. Uh, we heard from a number of people that Whole Foods and strip malls, people are worried about losing their tenants because they can't assure them that they will have adequate power. So we've had these conversations in the past, but I want you to know that I will be working with the business community in this regard. Uh, there are two other meetings taking place this week. There's a meeting uh, tonight with the Civic Fed community that is meeting with talking about public power. There's a meeting on Thursday night in which the Power, uh, power Up Montgomery County and the Pack Up Montgomery, Pack Up Pepco are meeting to discuss public power. Um, this is an issue. PEPCO's reliability is obviously a critical issue to our community, and it just manifests itself time and time again. One of the ways in which it manifests itself in which we'll be having a hearing on on Thursday is our WSSC lost power in that major storm that we had uh, earlier this summer. Ladies and gentlemen, we were hours away from not being able to respond to a fire because we would not have had water sufficient in the system to put out a fire. So we are sitting down on Thursday with WSSC. I say we, it will not be me because I'll be in New York, but our, our committee will be having an oversight meeting with WSSC to figure out what has to happen so that they do not lose power and that we're not ever in a situation where people are, where we're concerned about not being able to respond to a public safety emergency. Um, the commission, the Public Service Commission, of course, on the 13th is having its legislative style meeting uh, with respect to the derecho and the utilities response to it. Our county uh, has filed comments uh, with respect to that uh, today, and we have copies of those comments if you'd care to see them. Recall that our county is an active participant before the Maryland Public Service Commission on behalf of our residents and fighting hard to make sure that the commission understands that enough is enough. We really have to get this system much stronger than it is. I think you all know that I was invited to 
uh, speak to the governor's task force, the first meeting that the governor's task force had on PEPCO's reliability, on utility reliability. And my presentation, I shared with you my presentation, but fundamentally we do really need to strengthen this system in a significant way. Um, PEPCO has a proposal in effect on the table to spend 900 plus million dollars to strengthen its system. And my uh, pitch, if you will, to the governor's people has been, if you're going to spend this kind of money, let's make sure that we are making the kind of system that serves us into the future. And there's an organization called Energy Future Coalition that has come forth and said that they would love to work with the state of Maryland and to use Montgomery County as a model for the nation and what a utility service ought to look like and how we can make our system far more resilient and provide the quality of service that we need. And my hope is that the governor uh, and our state will take up the Energy Future Coalition's offer to make Montgomery County a model. It is the perfect place and it is a place where then Montgomery County, instead of being at a competitive disadvantage because of its lack of reliable electric service, we could actually have a very positive story to tell about how we are the future of utilities. Uh, microgrids, things of that nature that uh, actually FDA, as you may know, in Silver Spring is on its own system, a microgrid system. It has not lost power since its system went up, okay? That's the kind of system that we need to be thinking about in the future. And uh, so I have said that the last thing I think we should do is spend $900 million and put Humpty Dumpty back together again. What we ought to do is to have a utility system that is appropriate for the future needs of our community and um, working as hard as I know how to help bring that about. We have a lot of ballot initiatives that I know that you folks are all following. Uh, I'm not going to speak to uh, any of the, the, if you will, the statewide ballot initiatives, but there is one obviously that we care deeply about on the county council and that is effects bargaining. And our council is committed to working very hard to make sure that we do everything we can to win that uh, ballot initiative. And it's not going to be an easy one to win because in many ways uh, we have the harder nuanced argument to make. But it is the right argument and nine Democratic members of this council, the county executive and the police chief, believe quite strongly that the unique effects bargaining that our uh, police union has is just not workable and hasn't been workable for many, many years. Uh, and so but it is going to be a tough fight, and we're going to we're going to take on this fight, and uh, it's just very important. So those are three sort of macro sets of issues. Let me raise a couple of other issues with you uh, that are near and dear to my heart. Uh, we are introducing tomorrow a bike share uh, initiative. Uh, as you know, our county. Uh, has lagged behind other jurisdictions in bike share. And we have been pushing very hard to f move forward aggressively uh, so that we have as robust, I apologize, so that we have as robust a bike share uh, program as any in the country. We did succeed in getting state money, uh, both uh, through a grant of over a million dollars in bond money that our state legislators worked very hard to get. Um, but we want to make sure that the private sector can participate easily in this process and provide back, uh, bike share stations. Um, so one of the initiatives that we will be introducing with uh, a council member, Valerie Irvin, who's been a strong proponent of bike share as well, is to um, green tape what does green tape mean? It basically says to the private sector, you don't have to jump through every hoop in the world in order to do this. And currently, in order to provide a bike share station, they would have to have a site plan amendment go to our planning board. And let me tell you, that's an expensive and lengthy proposition. 
our legislation would eliminate that, so they would not have to have a site plan amendment. And, and secondly, we do collect today transportation impact fees, and we collect them for things like bike lanes. We can collect them for things like bike lockers. Well, we currently don't collect them for things like bike share stations. So we will add bike share stations to the list of, uh, of things that can be funded with our transportation impact fees. Of course, these impact fees are designed to help us reduce congestion. And that's, of course, what bike share stations will help us do. So I'm pleased about that initiative, and I'm confident that it's something that my colleagues will look favorably upon. Um, finally, we have um, legislation that I've introduced with a number of my colleagues uh, on economic development that goes to the uh, Fed Committee uh, t today, this afternoon. Uh, and the essence of that legislation is to say to uh, our county folks, we need a strategy. That's pretty simple. We need an economic development strategy. If we're going to spend millions of dollars on economic development activity, we would like to make sure that, that those dollars are part of a cohesive plan that we have actually signed off on and that everybody knows this is what we're trying to achieve with our economic development dollars. And so it's pretty straightforward. It says, send us a plan and update it on a regular basis that shows how our economic development dollars that you are suggesting to us are furthering our economic development objectives. Uh, we currently don't have that. So this is Economic Development 101 unlike Utility 2.0. <laughs> With that, why don't I turn it over to you guys and see what's on your mind. Yes. Well, there I have heard from residents who are concerned about smart meters. Uh, and I understand that. There are some people that are concerned about the charge in them. Uh, there are some people that are concerned about privacy sets of issues. Um, so there have been concerns raised about them. I will say to you that I personally believe that smart meters are an important part of reducing the amount of time that people have outages. One of the wonderful things about a smart meter is that it immediately tells Pepco, this house is out of power and is still out of power. You know how much trouble we've had, one, Pepco knowing who's out of power, and two, knowing when actually the power has been turned on. <laughs> because sometimes Pepco would call people and say, your power's on, and they'd be in the dark saying, I don't think so. <laughs> so this is a way in which Pepco would immediately know who's out of power and how long they're out of power and give consumers the ability to reduce their consumption because ultimately our appliances are going to, in effect, we're going to be talking to our appliances. You know, we're going to be using our iPhones and we're going to be talking to our smart meter and we're going to say, turn down the air conditioning, turn down the, AC, the, the refrigerator or turn down my lights. You know, we are going to, in the future, have that capacity. And smart meters are going to be the, one of the gateways to that. So it is part of, in my judgment, Utility 2.0. And it's not to say that people don't have concerns about it. But on balance, I believe it is a good thing. I believe that we are going to increasingly have to have privacy protocols and that the Public Service Commission is going to have to make sure that this kind of information doesn't get sold to other people. Mm -hmm. So yes, and these are issues that utilities across the country are grappling with in the context of smart meters. I don't believe it's an insolvable pop problem. I don't believe it ought to preclude us to make the advances that I think are necessary. And with them being wireless, uh, one of the other things that they brought up was it's possible for hackers to be able to get into that without Pepco's knowledge. Are you familiar with this or without 
I don't know enough about that. I think there there are concerns about hackers getting into the utility system, uh, which is another reason why uh, I support more microgrids of of having a less centralized utility system. Uh, but I'm not familiar with the specific concerns with respect to smart meters as it relates to hackers. Thank you. A couple of years ago, there was a uh, work group that studied the amount of visitors were moving, uh, and measured of course, the visitors were moving as a result of outages. Has there been any newer, more, more recent studies? There really hasn't been, and it's something that I do think that, quite frankly, it is incumbent upon the Public Service Commission, and I, I've shared this as well, because when you talk about cost-effectiveness, when you talk about what should we spend to have a more resilient utility system, you can't answer that unless you know what it's costing you not to have a resilient, reliable utility system. So there are numbers that we, the county, put out there previously, and quite frankly, in the region in that last major storm that we had this summer, it was estimated at over a billion and a half dollars that the region itself suffered, and I would imagine that Montgomery County was a big chunk of that. So that when you talk about needing to make investments, you're right, Rachel, you need to know how much are we losing every year by having an unreliable system. PEPCO has a burden in any rate case to demonstrate that what it is doing is prudent. I haven't reviewed the record with respect to that. So the Commission is right to make sure that PEPCO is doing what they ought to be doing and proving that the smart meters that they're using are appropriate. I, again, not having studied the record with respect to it, I, I can't speak to it. I can tell you that in my judgment, that our ratepayer advocates, the Office of Ratepayer Advocates in, in Maryland, has taken a very hard line view with respect to energy efficiency, with respect to renewables, with respect to uh, things like smart meters, and, and has challenged the cost effectiveness of these types of investments. I'm not as convinced as they are that those are the right fights to be having, quite frankly, because I believe that the cost of not having power, of somebody being without power for two to three days, is very important, and a smart meter will help us overcome that. I'm not convinced that energy efficiency, particularly if you don't take into account the greenhouse gas emissions and things of that nature, that our test with respect to cost effectiveness is appropriate. So I've had my, I believe they perform an invaluable service by fighting for ratepayers, but I also believe that, that they are totally focused on ratepayer bottom line and not sometimes a larger picture. In Pepco Lost Cause, you're meeting with two groups this week that, to talk about that are supporting public utilities. You went through what you want the future to look like, and it doesn't really seem to look like what Pepco's doing. So is it a lost cause? Is this now you have to go? Uh, the county has to now look at its own utility. Well, we explored this issue, uh, and it's an important issue. Public power, in my judgment, is a legitimate response. And am I confident that PEPCO can produce the quality of services that we need in Montgomery County? I'm not. Do I continue to believe that public power would reflect our values, would not have to send money to shareholders, would not be part of a holding company that has different financial obligations? Absolutely. Public power in its various forms, like we have in Southern Maryland. SMEPCO is a very successful example of public power. Southern Maryland Electric Co-op. Okay, public power is like a co-op. It's run by the people for the people. Okay, that's a pretty good model in my judgment. But we have been told by our county attorney and affirmed by our attorney general that we cannot do that without the state legislature blessing it. And I've been told by people that are very familiar with the workings of Annapolis <coughs> that don't count on the state legislature giving Montgomery County that authority. So while I continue to believe it is a legitimate response, 
uh, I'm hearing that politically this would be a heavy lift. Uh, so I think both have to be pr pursued. We have to see whether or not it's possible to give us enabling legislation to explore it because public power would not come about easily. Public power, you would have to do a condemnation proceeding. You'd have to be able to pay for it in a way that is manageable. So these are big issues that one would have to very carefully work their way through. I haven't worked my way through. Do I think it is worth exploring? Yes. Do I think the state ought to give Montgomery County the right to explore it and adopt it if subject to a referendum? I would make it subject to a referendum. My goodness, if, if gambling can be subject to a referendum in uh, Prince George's County, do I think public power could be subject to a referendum in Montgomery County? And if the people of Montgomery County, after hearing the facts, said yes, we should go forward with public power, I think that would be an appropriate way to proceed. But I'm just told that uh, PEPCO feels quite confident that that will never happen. PEPCO officials have looked me straight in the eye and said, Roger, public power will never happen. So they may be right, in which case we have to improve this system every which way we can. Is that what you're going to tell some of the people that you're meeting with this week, that PEPCO's told you that? I mean, uh, I, you're passionate about this, the, the groups that are pushing this. I mean, what can you say to them? If well, that's part of the reason why we're having these meetings. On Thursday, we're meeting uh, the, the Pack, Pack Up PEPCO and the, the grassroots organizations. I've arranged a meeting with our county attorney who has done the work before the Maryland Public Service Commission because so many people without the knowledge of the public utility world, they go, well, let's have public power. Why can't we have that? And I understand their frustration when you say, well, it's not so simple. So that's why we've had uh, the attorney who's done our work before the P Public Service Commission meet with them so he can explain to them the barriers that exist to achieving this. Now, these are not insurmountable barriers, but they are significant. So that's what I tell them. Don't think that this will come easily. I can't speak to a particular vendor, but my expectation is that our, our goal is to have an integrated regional approach. So I, uh, without getting into you know, that kind of detail, yes, what we want is to build on the success in the District of Columbia, build on the success of Northern Virginia, and bring an integrated package together. We had pushed real hard to have this up and running by the end of this year. Our Department of Transportation is saying, uh, Council President, that may be a little more ambitious than we can pull off. It could be spring of next year. But we're talking about uh, 29 stations uh, in Bethesda, Friendship Heights, the Medical Center, Tacoma Park, and uh, Silver Spring. And so we're looking to have a serious serious bike share program. And also when you factor in, I guess, the bike lanes, will that be a separate project in itself to kind of coexist with the bike share program? Yes. Because Montgomery County is a little bit more spread out and not as, I guess, bike friendly, I don't know, in comparison to the district because, you know, it's a lot more cars and everything is a little bit more uh, widespread. Yes. Uh, bike lanes are very much a part of the conversation, but on, a, if you will, a separate track. So we, we have our, a process for that, and we've been fairly aggressive in, in promoting them. Victor. When dealing with the transportation are you also planning to increase the pie itself? You know, say, will we be increasing the fee to this, or is it just another option? This is just another option. And again, it's an option that we currently make available for bike lockers and things of that nature. So that's a logical extension at a time when we are promoting this new system. And forgive me, I didn't actually see the limitation, but is there a specific like, percentage you want to cut off or the strict limit? No, because we don't do that with anything. We just make these projects available for the developer and for our DOT 
to figure out what should we spend these dollars on. Okay. You mentioned the money that had already been acquired for bike sale. How much more do we need? What are we looking at in terms of that? Well, with I can't really speak to that, uh, Mr. Bolt. Uh, I mean, we've. We, I believe that we have enough to launch this system. How much total do you have right now? A million two. I think is about the right number. We got over a million dollars in a grant and I think $250,000 in a bond bill. So a million two, million three. And I, and I, it may not be enough to do 29 stations, so I'll, I'll have to get back to you with respect to what the thought is with respect to that. So just to make sure I understand, so the, in order to get more, in, including bike share stations within Connect 15, um, is that meant to then just sort of promote expansion system, or is it meant to sort of help um, pay for the 29 bus route? Uh, as I said, I'll have to get back to you with respect to how far the dollars that we've gotten get us to the 29 stations, um, and I just don't have that off the top of my head. I'll, I'll claim recess cobwebs. Speaking of recess cobwebs, what can you share with us about the Democratic Convention? Well. I'm a little reluctant to have a conversation here insofar as I certainly did not go as the county council right. president. Uh, I did go. Uh, do I think it is important for Montgomery County, this election? I do. Um, but I'd be happy to chat with you uh, my personal uh, reflections, uh, but it, it really seems inappropriate as council president to opine on national political sets of issues. Anything else, gang? All right, nice to be with you again. See you in two weeks.